Well, we're going to be looking at God's Word as we work our way through um, the question of what is it that's worthwhile standing up for, even if it costs you everything? What do you think is worthwhile dying for? Honour? Cultures would hold that up as the number one thing to die for. Family honour or freedom? Trying to get your country's land back if you wanted to ask the people in, in Ukraine and many other countries around this world. There are people I know who travel the world even to the hot spots because they want to see the world. They think, well, if I die doing it, that's okay. Or maybe you might climb Mount Everest or half climb it. Fame? For everyone to remember you? Fortune? That's an easy one, isn't it? Plenty of people do that. Work? Yeah, I reckon I know that's an easy one to fall into, isn't it? Not that we'd put it that way. Uh, love? Definitely. Sex? Without a doubt. These are the things that people think are worthwhile dying for. Uh, today we begin a series into uh, Christian beliefs, which is different to that list I read out before. Um, what are things about God that are worthwhile standing firm on to the point that if it costs you everything, that is a better option than giving in? What are truths that are worthwhile dying for? Truths about who God is and what God says and how we should live if we want to follow him. How about I pray for us? Because this is a, we're about to begin a series for the next four weeks. We'll continue it again a little later on, on truths worth dying for. Let's pray, shall we? Our loving Heavenly Father, uh, so much of life we just choose the easy roads because that's the way we've been bred. Help us to know what is it about you that is worthwhile standing firm on regardless. Help us to know why we stand firm and help us Lord to have the courage to do so we ask this Lord in your precious name amen well how do you do anything with certainty I remember uh, when I used to do assignments at school and I did do them in case you were doubting that um, oh, the first thing I would do is to go up to the local library which I did do you'd probably doubt that too and look in the World Book Encyclopedia because that was the number one reference point of anything that's worthwhile knowing or Encyclopedia Britannica because the British wrote it. Now I just go to Google and when I go to Google I get what anyone says about anything regardless of whether they know anything. Or I'd like to ask a world expert but I've never found one. That's the way we gather information, isn't it? How do we know anything with certainty? How do you know what is good and bad and right and wrong? Or how do you know what's the best car to buy? Or how do you know where's the best house bargain? Or whatever it is that you're chasing down at the time. How do you find out information? And when it comes to all of your life decisions, how do you do that? Do you go to the person in the white lab coat because they always know what's true? Or do you go to Google because that always knows what's true? Let's narrow the question down. When it comes to following God, how do you know what's right and wrong? How do you discern about truth about God from error? How do you even know if God exists? That's a different question. How do you know God once you know he exists? That's the question I'm looking at. How does God view you? How do you relate to God? How do you relate to him properly or with certainty or is it just a matter of giving it a go and seeing what happens? What does God want you to do? What does God want you to not do? Uh, or does God even care what you do? Now, it's a big question, all of those, and because we don't want to be here for sort of six or seven days in a row, um, I'm going to narrow it down a bit more. Those other questions will keep coming back to at some level and you might want to ask the broader, broader than Christianity questions because I think Christianity is the only right way to engage God and you might want to think differently and we can just talk about that later. But I want to narrow it down is if we follow the God of the Bible, 
how do we know what, how to answer those questions I asked before? You know, like who he is and what does he want us to do or not do or does he care and those sorts of questions. How do we relate to him properly? Of course, we're going to say today, sitting here in this church, let's just look in the Bible. Well, we might say that because that's what we do all the time. But is the Bible the only place we want to look? Um, is the Bible the best place to look or is it just one of a number of other ways or places we could look? Is it as reliable as everything else or is it more reliable? Uh, what, what input should um, the church history or church traditions have? Um, I've been asked, am I, am I really Anglican? Plenty of times, by the way, because I didn't do things that churches had historically done. Should, so should the traditions of the church have input into what we're doing? What about lived experience? Just the tip of the iceberg of the possible ways to find out God. Is, it, is, is the Bible one of many ways to find out about the God of the Bible? Um, and if there are other ways to find out about the God of the Bible, is that better or worse way? Is that a better or worse way? How reliable is it going to be? And if we've got lots of competing information sources, which one's the supreme authority? Or is there such thing as that? You see, these are big important questions. You might not have thought of them on the way to church this morning. My gut feeling is it was the traffic and the time that were probably on the mind. Or unless you were Jared and that, there were other things. But if we get the answer to these questions wrong, these are really important, and if we get them wrong... It could actually mean that we are no longer a church that follows the God of the Bible. Or you might not be a person who follows the God of the Bible. So pretty vital questions. On our website, we've got a number of statements. My gut feeling is that if you have been part of this church for a long time, you've never looked at the website uh, and to what we believe. Or maybe you're relatively new and you've looked it up and thought, I want to know what the heck these guys are on about. We've got nine statements that define us as a Christian church. Um, These statements address things that we think are worthwhile fighting for, things that are worthwhile standing our ground on. Now, except for the first one, which we're looking at today, you could probably say that none of them are really in any order of importance. But the first one is there because actually everything else flows from this first one. Let me read it to you so you know what I mean. The Holy Scriptures, as originally given, are divinely inspired and infallible. As the Word of God, the Bible holds supreme authority in all matters of faith and conduct. That's a big statement, isn't it? I want to unpack some of that. We'll be here for about six days. Um, And... um, uh, where I want you to be able to think through some of the things it raises. Maybe you will get the opportunity to think further about these and chase a few more rabbits further down the hole. Maybe ask questions. You can do that over morning tea or today we have a barbecue, so feel free to do that and roast me instead of the, cho- the sausages. What are we claiming about the Bible and its authority? We're claiming that it has, for the Christian... The Christian faith uh, it addresses everything that we need to know. And we'll see why that's important and why it's dangerous to go elsewhere. Let's unpack it. Uh, the statement begins, the scriptures are divinely inspired. Um, we want to clearly affirm that the Bible is divine in origin. Now, what I don't mean is this. I don't mean that the Bible is God or it should be worshipped. Um, We often will put this Bible there or there, and if you are from a different faith, you'd be deeply offended that the Bible's on the floor because they worship the Bible. So Islam and the Quran. I, I, I don't mean that we worship it. The Bible is divine in origin, that's what I mean. It's from the one true living God, Yahweh, the God of the Bible. And he's a God who speaks and reveals himself to his 
to his world through his spoken word, his written word. It's been recorded. He spoke and it's been recorded. And it's been recorded so that we can read it today. For generation after generation, we can, we can know God because God has revealed himself to us. He's caused it to be written down and preserved so that if you're not very good about, in speaking about it, the next generation can grasp hold of it. It's enabled us to translate it. So you don't need to know the original language. Uh, could you imagine how we would all go if the Bible reading was read out to us in Greek, which is the two readings came from the New Testament, or Hebrew if it's from the Old Testament, or bits of it are from Aramaic. I'd, I'd be cactus, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have the foggiest what it's about. If that's, but we can translate into English and other languages. See, God caused his word to be written down so it wasn't just one group of people who could grasp hold of it, but many groups of people. And God's word written down is unlike every other worldview. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 5, God's word says, Like a scarecrow in a melon patch, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. I think I was watching Getaway yesterday, and, uh, and it was promoting uh, the worldview of a country that it was in and the idols were sitting there unable to speak unable to do the version the word of god the word of god is divine in origin it comes from a god who speaks to his world now because the word of god is uh, comes from a God, it also, from God, sorry, it, not from a God, I'll be careful what I say there, um, it reflects God's character, doesn't it? So when you speak, you reflect your character. When God speaks, he reflects his character. And so what is the character of God? Well, God doesn't lie, does he? That's one of the things we know about God. It says in God's word, Numbers 23 verse 19, God is not like people who lie. He's not a human who changes his mind. Whatever he promises he does, he speaks and it is done. So, so God is just not a God who lies. God is a God who speaks and what he speaks is truthful and comes to pass. His spoken word that is written down reflects his character. And God's word, reflecting God's character, we're reminded that God is 100% faithful to everything he promises. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, we can read God's word and respond to God's word. And it says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. God's word reveals God's character to us, English-speaking people, a few thousand years after it was written. So what I'm saying is this, God, through his word, through his written word, has revealed himself truthfully to his world. That's what we believe. God has revealed himself to his world and God relates to his world. So if we reject what God's word says, we're rejecting the God who gave it. There's big implications, isn't there? If we don't like what God's word says then we reject the God who gave it to us. Our website raises that and then goes on to say more than that. It goes on to say that the Bible as originally given is God's inspired word. Now, I don't mean that God's word is inspiring like a great movie or a great picture or an opera, if you like it. I'm not, I don't... Th well, God's word, let's say, is inspiring, but that's not what we're saying about it when we say it's inspired. When we say it's inspired, we're saying God caused it to be written down. But when God caused it to be written down, he didn't possess people and take them over so their character and their language weren't reflected. So some of it's written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek because the people wrote or the people of the time communicated in, in Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek. 
So God reveals himself, inspiring people to write down stuff. But when they write down stuff, they doesn't remove their personality and doesn't remove their location and their language from them. So when you do read the Bible, you can see the personality of the authors. You can see it in what they wrote. But when they wrote what they wrote, they weren't writing their own thoughts and words. They were writing down what God wanted them to write down. Now, you might think, oh, how do I hold all that together? Uh, how, how does God cause people to write down stuff that reflects their nature and character and location, and yet what they write down is what God wanted them to write down? It's not all that hard if you're the sovereign Lord of all the universe to cause people to write down stuff that he wants them to write down. Uh, we don't want to put God into our little box, and our little box says, I find it hard to understand, therefore it doesn't exist. The creator of the universe has no problem causing people to write what he writes, what he wants them to write, reflecting their own personality. We, in the website, go on to say that God's word is infallible. Now, apart, unless you're a parent, you probably don't use that word all that often, do you? That was a joke, but you won't get it. <laughs> it's a dad joke. Uh, the topic of infallibility is complicated, isn't it? Let me give you a really short definition of the topic of infallibility. Uh, when I say that God's word is infallible, I mean God's word will never fail you. It, will, it is completely trustworthy in doing what God gave it for us to do, in doing what God gave it to us for, might be a clearer way to put it. Uh, in my shed, there are a number of tools um, sometimes my tools break. Like I discovered not all that long ago that chopping wood and metal wrecks a circular saw blade because the, the circular saw blade was never intended to chop through my desk bench top. Funny that, isn't it? And if you've got a Stanley knife, just so you know, in case it's not a great revelation to you, whilst they do open tins, a Stanley knife doesn't last very long if you use it to open tins, because we are misusing what the tool was for. Well, God's word is completely trustworthy. It is able to do exactly what God intended it to do. It's given to us for the task that God gave it to us for. Let me give you a word of warning here. Sometimes when we talk about infallibility, we claim more than what we should. As I said, the word can be complexly used. Did you know that every word in the Bible is not true? Not every word in that Bible is true. I don't know what way to put it. I think I put it the wrong way. I hope at least it'll wake you up, if nothing else. So it wasn't intended to be. Do you know a parable? Uh, God, or Jesus spoke most of the parables. Jesus gives us a fictional story, one that people can relate to really well to teach a point, but you don't think that the parable is exactly what happened, do you? The parable is told as a story to make a point. It was never intended to be taken literalistically. You would misunderstand a parable if you took it literalistically, wouldn't you? Now, I'm sure that's got some thinking, but I want you to do thinking. And if you fail to understand the type of literature you're reading, you might misapply it. If you take it out of its context, if you take it out of its place in salvation history, you will misapply it. And that has led to many misapplications of scripture when, you, when people have done that. So God's word will always do what God intended it to do. Uh, where did we read from 2 Timothy 3? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the people of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's God's word working out its purposes and plan, God's purpose and plan in our lives. Now having said that that's what God's word plans to do, it's still very accurate in historical details, but guess what? If God's word spells the name of a king wrong, it doesn't instantaneously make God's word rubbish. People spell lots of different things in different ways. 
just look at my English tests. And if you really don't believe it's just me, look at the original maps of Australia, where people spelt things the way they sounded. It was different to the way it was spelt. And so if you dig up something, a manuscript or a plaque with so-and-so, the king's name on it, and it's spelt differently to what that's in the Bible, that's no big deal. God's word is infallible still. It achieves everything that God planned it to do. To teach, rebuke, correct and train you and I in God-honouring, righteous living so that we might be thoroughly equipped for every good work that God has for us. Now, as I said, this is a huge debate. I haven't used an even more confusing word in this, the word inerrant, if you've ever come across that one. Uh, It's not because I don't believe the Bible is inerrant, it's just that people use that word incredibly differently and it can be very confusing. See, some people use the word inerrant meaning that there's no change, in, there's no spelling mistakes in anything. So the king name spelt wrong? The Bible's inerrant? Well, if the king's name spelt wrong, it wouldn't be, would it? See, you can take it to an extreme meaning. Um, sometimes people use the word inerrant in the idea that God dictated every word in the sense that it was spelt the way God wanted it to be spelt. You can see how claiming more leads you only into problems. So I think the Bible is infallible, and I'll keep using that word. The word inerrant is often misunderstood. I'm sure you're going to get the phone buzzing or the questions or the emails. Let's keep going. If you want to think through that question a little more, I sent to everyone who's on our email system um, a copy of the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. I hope you enjoy reading it. And if, it, if you're tired tonight, just read it or listen to my sermon. It'll put you to sleep. It's worthwhile thinking through this stuff, isn't it? so that we might know why things are worthwhile standing firm on. Um, I'm going to recommend a book a little later on that we might find helpful. Uh, I'm a bit sorry if your mind's swimming with information. It is your own fault for not taking notes. But you can actually, if you want to just read through some of this, um, you can listen to it again or, as I said, give you some stuff to read through. I want to read it, move on. Our website says that we believe in the divinely inspired and divine inspiration and fallibility of Holy Scriptures as originally given. And what version of your, the Bible do you think's best? Uh, many years ago, I had someone, when we were in the homeschooling world, who argued that King James Version was the one that Jesus and the Apostles used, which I think was just a bit of an overstatement. Uh, I don't know whether they were serious, uh, but anyhow... They said it. What, what, do you, what do you reckon's the best version of the Bible? I've had plenty of people argue the version of the Bible with me. Don't you worry about that. The statement we make is about the original documents. So the, the original, as originally given. So how many of the original documents do we own? How many of the original documents can we read? Zero. Zero. And people made copies of the original documents. And those original documents got spread out. Thousands of copies of these original documents got spread out all over the known world. And when we, when we gathered them, and a huge number have been found, we can be certain, we can be pretty certain, you can be completely confident that nothing of any substance varies from the original documents. That's whether you use the NIV or your favourite version. Well, I'll just say, careful on the fo- your favourite version, because there's some uh, paraphrases that move a long way from the original. Translators can make mistakes, can't they? Can't, translators can orig- make mistakes on purpose, or they can make them by accident. They can copy on purpose. Sorry, they can accidentally copy mistakes, and they can on purpose copy mistakes. And in all of those original documents that we've... Sorry, in all of those copies that we've found, we can be confident as we put together pretty much most of the main modern translations that you can be confident that what we've got is there. If you're uncertain, you can ask more questions about that. Going back to that topic of inerrancy, it would almost be impossible to claim that an inerrant translation exists, wouldn't it? because people make mistakes on purpose or accidentally. Again, do some more research on it. 
The next thing we claim is that there are, the Bible is the supreme authority on informing us as a church on who God is and what God is like and what God's plans and purposes are and what God is doing and not doing and what we should be doing and not doing. We're back where we started, aren't we? We don't like authority. We don't like someone telling us what to do. And let me tell you, when we find something that we want to do and the Bible says not to do it, we'll do our best to try and find a way around it if you're anything like me. When it comes to God's word, when it comes to living as God's people in God's world, God's word has supreme authority. It recognises that we have competing authorities, don't we? We're warned about people who teach what your rich and ears want to hear. We're told in Galatians to cling to the gospel as originally given. Even if an angel from heaven comes with a different gospel, then don't bother listening to them. Numerous times in the Bible we're warned of that and it happens all the time today. Now most people, most, so most religious groups today will reference the Bible. They will say things from the Bible, quote things from the Bible... But they might think, they often think that there are, other, there are other authorities that have greater input. So if you're, if you're into the Mormons, which are not a Christian group, by the way, they regularly quote from the Bible. But they see that the Bible that they quote from is full of errors. The Jehovah's Witness, they regularly quote from the Bible. They think they're Christian, they're certainly not. But their ruling council has supreme authority. If you come from a Roman Catholic background, they use the Bible too, don't they? But the authority that they see, the ultimate authority that they have, is not just the Bible, it's all the teachings of the church at equal level to the Bible, and the Pope sits above them with the ultimate authority in the church. The liberal Anglicans in Adelaide, they claim they have the hold to the authority of Scripture, but they quite openly tell us the Spirit now leads us differently. The ultimate supreme authority is certainly not scripture. They think their thinking, their gut feeling more often than not, is wiser than the word of God. You see, people use the Bible. What we are claiming is that it's the supreme authority in knowing what to believe and how to live in all matters of faith and conduct, which is our final part of the statement. Um, I don't know whether you've ever tried to work out maths or calculus, but can I suggest if you're trying to refresh your your childhood memories of calculus that you don't go to the Bible. It's it's useless for teaching you about calculus. Um, If you're into nuclear physics, no good for that either. If you're trying to work out how to fix your computer, apart from the fact I've been told to take the Bible off the keyboard because that was causing the problem, but, but, but normally the Bible actually doesn't help you fix the computer problems. If you're wanting to build your car or fix your car, it's pretty useless for that. And playing chess, the Bible is only ever good for dropping on the chess game you're about to lose. You see, it's important that we don't use God's word for an, uh, and think it does something that it was never intended to do. All matters of faith and conduct, however, it addresses that very well. Well, there's a lot in that. And you might be thinking there, saying, you are saying the Bible is God's word and you are quoting the Bible to prove that the Bible is God's word. Isn't that going around in a circle? Um, The Bible is the supreme authority on God, but but the Bible says it's the supreme authority on God. So that's where I got it from. Can I just um, just add, if, if you think you know everything about God you are putting yourself as a supreme authority. What right do you have to put yourself as a supreme authority? Well, the Bible's doing that. It's God's word. It's been revealed to us by God. What would give us the idea that that's a wise belief, uh, a valid belief? Well, when you got converted, the number one thing that pointed out to you that God's word is valid is the fact that God's word is valid because you, sh- you, you now have God's spirit in you. Isn't that exciting? And when you got converted, God's spirit before you were converted was the one who was pointing out to you that you needed to repent and believe that you're a sinner who needs forgiving 
and that Jesus is the means of that forgiveness. And God's spirit working in you continues to show you that God's word is believable. The second thing that's worthwhile just thinking about as we unpack uh, God's word um, and is it really a valid belief to think that God's word is supreme authority? Jesus uses God's word as the supreme authority, doesn't he? So just the, probably the most notable example is when he's um, just been starved for 40 days and the devil tries to tempt him. What does he do? He doesn't think, oh, I've got a couple of, a couple of thoughts I could just share with you on to why that's not a good idea. No, no, Jesus quotes God's word back at the devil. You see, Jesus considered God's word, scripture, that's the Old Testament for Jesus, as the final court of appeal on matters of faith and conduct. So if Jesus did it, it makes sense that we would do likewise, wouldn't it? And just finally, God's word claims to be the supreme authority from God. I think it's a reasonable claim because it actually makes sense of the world. Remember unpacking Ecclesiastes a couple of months ago, three and a half thousand years ago, speaks directly to us today as God's people dealing with the issues of today as God's people. God's word makes sense of the world. God's promises are fulfilled. God's written word containing God's promises are fulfilled hundreds of years after they are made. God's word speaks accurately about life. God's word speaks accurately about what God is doing in this world. God's word speaks accurately and he fulfills his promises hundreds of years later. There's a lot in this topic. What happens if we don't take it seriously? Well, we become Adelaide Anglicans again, don't we? We walk away from the truth of God's word. And if you deny an effort, they'll make you a bishop. You see, when you water down God's word, you go off any way you want to. You're taught, you teach yourself what your itching ears want to hear. You get distracted. You rationalise your own lifestyles. You preach heresy. Uh, I said there's a couple of things you could look at. Uh, This series comes from a Bible study series. If you're interested in finding out about that Bible study series, let me know. There's two books that I would recommend. One is a thick book, so none of us will read it. It's called The Revelation of God. It's written by a guy called Peter Jensen. And one is over there on the shelves, uh, Know the Truth. Bruce Milne wrote it. He's got lots of topics he addresses there and he'll give you some good direction just to unpack and start thinking through this topic at a greater depth. Why don't I pray? Our loving Heavenly Father, we we do thank you for your written word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself. We don't have to guess who the heck you are and how to live as your people. We thank you for your faithfulness in bringing your word to us today. We thank you for your comprehensive, the comprehensive nature of your word that addresses everything that we need to know as your people in all matters of faith and conduct, even today. Lord, help us have the courage to hold on to it in a, in a society that doesn't believe it, in a denomination that often denies it. Uh, Lord, help us to have the confidence to actually uh, live in light of your word, even when it's completely different to what we would do or want to do. Because we want to live in a way which honours you, our Lord and our Saviour. We thank you for the great salvation that you've won for us. Help us to glorify you in the way that we live as your people. Amen.